My name's Dr. Gary Crotez, and I'm a coach, podcaster, and award-winning author of The Idea Mindset, a book about how to figure out what you want and how to get it. The unlock moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. When I'm in conversation with my coaching clients, these are the breakthroughs that are so profound that they remember vividly where they were, who they were with, what they were thinking when their unlock moment happened. In this podcast, I'll be meeting and learning about people who have accomplished great things or brought about significant change in their life. And you'll be meeting them with me. We'll be finding out what inspired them, how they got through the hard times and what they learned along the way that they can share with you. Thank you for joining me on this podcast to hear all about another Unlock Moment. Hello, dear listener, and welcome to another episode of the Unlock Moment podcast. Today, we're going supersonic with a pioneer in combat aviation. This is an episode I've been really looking forward to recording. Laurie Drowdy is a seasoned leader and entrepreneur who advises and coaches executives and founders on how to improve their leadership. She's the author of the recently published best-selling book, Soar Into Joy, a combat pilot's wisdom on falling in love with your life and a sought-after speaker for her entertaining and inspirational talks about how to soar professionally and personally. Laurie draws on her years of experience in the tech industry and the US Navy, where she was one of the first women to fly combat jets. She deployed twice to the Persian Gulf, accumulating over 300 carrier landings and 1,600 flight hours. After completing her naval service, Laurie led product marketing and operations teams at startups and tech companies, including Google and Meta. Laurie holds an MBA from Wharton and a BA in mathematics from the University of San Diego. She's the host of the Supersonic Leaders and Teams podcast and a certified yoga instructor. But her path wasn't all glory and success. Laurie has been laid off, forced to shut down her startup due to lack of funding, been divorced, fired, and quit her job. She wrote a one woman show called I Feel the Need about the first West Coast aircraft carrier deployment with women in combat squadrons. The show debuted off Broadway in New York and also played at the Edinburgh Festival here in the UK. I'm looking forward to hearing her take on challenging established mindsets on an aircraft carrier, the soaring highs and crashing lows of life's roller coaster. And of course, I'm curious to learn about the unlocked moments of remarkable clarity that shaped her journey. Laurie Drowdy, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Unlock Moment. Thank you so much, Gary. I really appreciate being here. Fantastic. Thanks so much for accepting the invitation. So today you're an advisor, a coach, a compelling speaker and a successful author. But where do we need to start in your story to understand that person you are today? I think we would have to go back to childhood, of course, all of the amazing influences that we each have as we're growing up that really shape a lot of who we are and and influence the the person that we come into this world as, which I think is just who we are. And as a child, I well, I am the oldest of three children. Uh, I have two younger brothers. I think from the beginning, I was in a position of leadership or at least uh, guidance, sometimes uh, (laughs) authoritative uh, dictatorship over my two brothers. I think having that responsibility from an early age, I took that seriously, you know, taking care of my younger brothers. And I remember when I was only about, I think, five or six years old, my middle brother is a year and a half younger than me, so not too much younger. And standing up to a neighborhood bully when he tried to steal my brother's big wheel. <laughs> and and I did it in a very quiet way. I was, you know, probably drawing something or doing something on my own, you know, at the playground and saw this kid bullying my brother. And I just got up, went over and pushed the kid off. So I, unfortunately, I did resort to violence at a young age. And, and then, you know, just went right back to what I was doing, you know, opened that path for my brother, let him get back on his big wheel. And so I think from an early age, I had the expectation that I would stand up for the underdog and also be someone who isn't afraid to stand up and to do things and to go down a, a different path. Where do you think that came from? Was that instinctive within you or do you think that was influenced by things around you? I think it's both. Uh, I do think there is both nature and nurture. I do feel like we come out a certain way. And the, the reason I say that is I have two children and 
it's amazing to you know, hear them laugh as adults. It's the same kind of laugh that they had little giggles when they were babies. And the way that they approach the world, you see a lot of that when they're very young, when they haven't had a whole lot of influence from the world around them. At the same time, I do feel like the environments we're in do have an influence on us and can change how we approach the world and how, how we act in the world. So I do feel like it's both. And tell me a bit more about the environment that you were growing up in and your family. I grew up in a military family. So my father was a career Marine Corps infantry officer. And my mother was a Marine officer for a year. So there's a heavy military influence, not only because they had both served, but also because we lived on military bases and we moved around at least every three years when I grew up. I think I went to like six or seven schools growing up and lived in areas as diverse as Germany and Kansas and Hawaii. So I actually really enjoyed moving around. Until I hit high school and we moved my freshman year from uh, Virginia, Northern Virginia to Hawaii. And that was a a really big change, not only geographically, but I went from a co-ed public high school to an all-girl Catholic school. And so at first it was really difficult. But I think what all of that moving around really forced me to do was to be adaptable and to be able to make friends easily. I feel like I am good with transitions because I've had a lot of transitions in my life. And so being able to have that resilience was something that moving around a lot taught me to do and and really reinforced because I had no other choice. (laughs) And you were studious, you were sporty, you were artistic. Oh my gosh. I was, I would say I was definitely studious. My parents enforced academics. I always joke with my dad, I had a paper one time that I brought home from a history class and I'd gotten like a 95 on it. And I was really proud, you know, and excited to show them. And he read it and went through and found a couple of typos that the teacher hadn't noticed on the essay. And he marked it up and asked me to bring it back to school. So, I mean, it was a very demanding upbringing. The expectation was that I would get good grades. But my parents were also incredibly supportive with that, of, you know, making sure that I had the resources I needed, and they did what they could to send me to good schools. So definitely academic. I would say I was more creative than athletic. I, you know, I did the cheerleading thing for two years of high school, but more because I really enjoyed dancing. And you know, cheerleaders, at least when I was a cheerleader, we did more dancing than the gymnastics that they do today. But so I would say I was very academic and I was very creative. I always did theater. I loved art classes. I loved writing. So. I feel like that was more of my school experience, but I I actually really enjoyed school. I was not a student athlete, though. (laughs) And did you always know that you were going to go into the military or did you think different things that you you could follow? I had a sense of duty, I think, from growing up in the military and from being in that environment from a very early age. I had a strong sense of appreciation for my country and for America and the freedoms we have. So I definitely grew up with an expectation that I would somehow serve. And when I graduated from high school, I didn't want to go to the academy. I really wanted a college experience where I wasn't wearing a uniform every day after going to Catholic school for many years. I wanted to uh, have a little more freedom. But I did want to do something in the military. So Because my father had been in the Marine Corps, I'd really only been exposed to the Marine Corps and the Navy. I didn't really know anybody in the Air Force or Army. So at the time, there weren't as many roles for women in the Marine Corps. and The Navy seemed like the best option. And so I applied for Navy ROTC. And I was able to um, earn a scholarship. I think it was three and a half years. So, And that's really what opened up the world of aviation to me because prior to that, I had no idea that I could fly. And, you know, I mentioned my dad was an infantry officer. We really weren't around air stations. And back then, you know, when we moved back and forth, most of the time it was throwing all the kids in the station wagon and driving across country, of course, except when we went to Hawaii and Germany. But so I really didn't even know that was an option for me. But yes, I always had a an expectation that I would serve. 
And when we were talking before the podcast and you were talking about this idea of an unlocked moment, there's something tied up in this ability to fly, an ability to be a pilot that's a real meaningful moment for you. So bring me into that moment. What was the moment when you knew that was your path? It was so unexpected. And I think that maybe that's part of what an unlock moment is, is it's unexpected and yet you know, <laughs> like there's something inside of you that gets triggered and opened up. So for me, it was being in Navy ROTC. We did a field trip my freshman year of college over the holiday break. I didn't really have any plans. Uh, my parents had just moved back to Camp Pendleton, California from Hawaii, where I had graduated from high school. I didn't really know anybody in Camp Pendleton. So when my Navy ROTC unit said that they were going to be doing a field trip over the break to some military air stations in Southern California, I thought, well, that could be interesting, you know, just get out of the house, go see something different. So we went on this field trip to, it used to be Naval Air Station Miramar. It's now a Marine Corps air station. And we went to a couple of other air stations that are no longer in Southern California, a couple of Marine Corps air stations that since have been shut down and turned into housing. And when we went on these field trips, I was the only female midshipman. And we saw these squadrons, we, we walked into these airplane hangars, and it was such a new and different environment that I was really fascinated. And I think, you know, there was that part of me that was used to doing different things, you know, used to really completely upending my life every three years and moving to a new place. And so to walk into that area and be in some place new felt very familiar and yet also exciting. The aircraft themselves were just so fascinating to me. All of the different buttons and the cockpits were just so, you know, they, they had all these labels on all the switches that I had no idea what they meant. <laughs> and, and so there was, it really stimulated that curiosity in me of what is this? Like, what is going on here? The pilots that were showing us around, showing all of us midshipmen around were really funny, all of them. And they all had this great sense of humor. And I just thought, wow, this seems like it would be a really fun environment to be in. There were no women <laughs> anywhere. And so I remember asking one of, one of the officers, you know what, this is really cool, but is this even an option for me? And he told me, you know, yeah, there are women who do this, but there aren't that many. And, um, you know, there's only a few types of airplanes you can fly. You know, I had heard of like the, the wasps and the waves and, you know, all the, the women who had volunteered in World War II and had flown in World War II. And they had flown transports, you know, they ferried airplanes from one place to another. They tested aircraft, you know, when they had been worked on. And so I was familiar with this concept of support, you know, combat support. You're not actually flying in combat, but you're doing something to help support the people who are and, you know, the men who are. So I thought, huh, this is interesting. I guess this is kind of, you know, women are still flying in the military. I, again, had no idea, no clue. And so when I went back to school after that break, I had a friend who had his private pilot's license. And I thought, you know, I'm going to explore this a little bit more. This seems like it could be really interesting. And when he took me up flying in San Diego, I absolutely fell in love with flying. It was, you know, something I had, I had never been in a small airplane like that. I had only been on airliners, and which is such a different experience. And being able to, you know, control this machine in the sky, it was like, what? This is so cool. So that was really the moment where I could see the path in front of me for at least the next 10 years. Or oh, gosh, then it was like 12, 13 years because I was still in college. So I knew I'd have a better chance of doing well in flight school if I had a technical major. So I think I was majoring in history or political science. So I switched my major to mathematics. And I joined our aviation club and, and then the movie Top Gun came out. So everybody was very excited about flying. And, and so there was a lot of attention being paid to it, but that was, I, I would say that field trip and then taking that flight with my friend was really what did it for me and made me realize, wow, there's this really cool opportunity out there. Like I had no idea that I could do this or that this was an option for me it really set me on a, a path that then, well, it absolutely influenced the rest of my life. Mm. 
And at that time, were women allowed to fly in combat? Or was that still before that had changed? It was still before the change. So I earned my commission in the Navy in 1989 and went to flight school that fall. The ban on women flying in combat was not lifted until about four years later, 1993. And did you, did you see that coming? Did you know that they were discussing it? They were thinking about it? We did, but people had been talking about it for a long time. <laughs> and it wasn't, you know, women had been flying in the Navy since the 70s. In fact, this year is the 50th anniversary of women in military aviation. And so I knew that, you know, there were women flying in the Navy and other services, except for the Marine Corps at the time. And, you know, we thought, okay, like, how long do we have to, you know, at the royal we, how long do we women have to perform and do this job before it's clear that, like, we can do more? And, and there were a few things, I think, that really pushed that change forward. One of them was the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. Women served in that war. They, some died, some were taken prisoner of war. And I think military leaders realized that there were many areas where if they had not had women there, they would have been in trouble. You know, women made up a lot of the support roles, supply, logistics, administration, just a lot of things that you need to be successful in a war, not just the fighters. And so, so that was part of it, that women had served honorably in that war. The second was Tailhook 91, which was unfortunately a um, Tailhook is a, uh, a naval aviation annual symposium, and it's an opportunity for aviators to gather and to hear from you know, defense contractors on the latest and greatest technology, and also to reunite with you know, former squadron mates. And unfortunately, I think in the years leading up to Tailhook 1991, there was just a lot of behavior that was criminal in many cases, but really unprofessional. And I think since Tailhook 1991 happened right after the first Gulf War, there were just some naval aviators who uh, sexually assaulted women. And unfortunately, that really tarnished the image of naval aviation, but it also brought a lot of attention to how women were being treated in the military. And so that was, you know, I, I think definitely a stimulus to change how women were perceived. And Finally, I would say um, the Clarence Thomas Supreme Court hearings with uh, Anita Hill testifying that she had been sexually harassed by him, that raised a lot of questions about how women were being treated in America. And overall, you know, how, what, what are women capable of doing in the workplace or in the military? So all of those things, I think, came to a head. And women had been serving, women had been flying, you know, for 20 years at that point in the Navy. And so and in the Air Force. And so finally, under President Clinton, the ban was lifted. And when that news came through, and you heard it for the first time, how did you feel? I was ecstatic. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I, because it was one of those things where you're like, yeah, we've heard this before. Like, yes, people, you know, people are saying women are great, but then change isn't happening. <laughs> and so, but then finally, that change happened. What I was excited about was that I felt like I could finally serve my country to the best of my abilities. When I went through the training command, as part of flight school and as part of getting my, my wings, I went through the exact same training as all of the men who then were going on to combat squadrons, but I was going to a combat support squadron. Part of the training was doing carrier qualifications, so learning how to land on an aircraft carrier in a jet. And I distinctly remember you know, sitting in my jet on the aircraft carrier flight deck, getting refueled, and looking out at this incredible ballet of sorts, this incredible team working together to launch aircraft off of aircraft carriers and recover aircraft safely, doing it all safely, doing it all, you know, just with precision timing. And I remember thinking, this is amazing. And I'm really sad that I can't be part of this just because I'm a woman. So when the, the law changed, I was really excited that I knew I was going to be able to go out and be on an aircraft carrier and serve in that capacity. And do you remember sitting on the launch pad for your, you know, on the runway for your first combat mission? Oh, gosh. Well, I remember definitely flying in the Persian Gulf. My squadron that I flew on the aircraft carrier in, 
is an S-3B squadron. It was originally an anti-submarine warfare squadron. They later changed that to sea control because we didn't do... The mission changed from going after submarines to really assisting the battle group with ensuring that there weren't any surface targets like ships that might be threats to the aircraft carrier. And that still might include submarines, but that mission shifted. So it wasn't so focused on going after a submarine. And so when I was in the Persian Gulf, the missions that we flew, we were in a combat area in the sense that it was in between the two Gulf Wars. And it was an area that was considered, I guess, at risk in the sense that, you know, you weren't completely safe there. And that was part of our mission was to go out and identify ship targets, surface targets, or contacts (laughs) that might be a threat to the aircraft carrier and the battle group. And so being out there in the Persian Gulf and flying around and, and doing that mission, it felt important. You know, it felt like I was doing something that was helping the battle group and, and the carrier in a different way than, you know, my fellow pilots who might be flying in a fighter jet who were actually going what we call feet dry. You know, they were flying over to Iraq and along the border and looking at making sure that our presence was felt in that area. For my squadron, our mission was really more around making sure the carrier and the battle group stayed safe. And then we also did quite a bit of organic fueling, which means that we would be the uh, the airborne tanker for any jets that came back that needed some extra gas before they came into land. So yeah, I, I guess what I felt was I felt like I was part of a, an amazing team and I was really grateful to be able to contribute to that. And it's interesting that that shift from sort of sitting on the sidelines watching the ballet and going, but I can't be a part of it just because I'm female to now I'm a part of it and now I'm contributing. So I I hear that really strongly. Did the men all take easily to women showing up as a peer? Oh, no. (laughs) No. (laughs) Um, And, you know, I, I really tried to be empathetic to their situation. You know, they were not used to having women around. and. Many of them had attitudes towards women that were not um, very supportive. And that was frustrating to feel like my capabilities or my, my abilities were being, you know, assumed to be less than a man's only because of my gender. Definitely, there are women who, you know, aren't qualified to fly. There are many men who are not qualified to fly. It's really not tied to gender and it's it's tied to skills and abilities that are that are not specific to gender. And so but some of the men on the carrier I think were just very set in their ways and they had a hard time being open to the fact that we women could do the job that they were doing. And I think that that was really hard for many of them to accept because their identity was so tied up in their role as a fighter pilot or, you know, an officer in the Navy, whatever job. But to be clear, there were many men who weren't thrilled about having women join, but they were open to it. And those were the ones who made it so much more successful. My squadron was, they were very supportive of me. They weren't happy about the change. I think, you know, they were worried. They were worried that I think it's very normal with a big change like that. It's uncomfortable and people worry that the new environment or the new uh, situation won't be as good as the old situation. And I think it was hard for some of the men to be open to, you know, maybe this change will make it better. Mm -hmm. So I was very lucky that my squadron mates, even though some of them, I don't think wanted to have women integrated. They still gave me the benefit of the doubt, and my uh, the other women aviator in my squadron, and Jana Raymond, they they gave us a chance, and that's all we really wanted, you know, was to be able to was to be able to do our job without feeling like people were against us being able to do our job. <laughs> you know, we we wanted to be part of the team. We wanted to, our team to be successful, and I think because we came in with that attitude, like, hey, we are here to be part of a team, and we want everyone here to to be successful in the work that we're doing. I feel like that that helped us. But also, you know, I have to give credit to the commanding officer in my squadron who 
you know, was a, a very strong leader and said, this is our new mission. We're going to make it work. And to all of the other men in the squadron who were open and supportive of us being part of that team. Did you feel that you could be yourself or did you feel that there was a pressure to sort of fit into how it was? It's a little bit of both. I feel I was successful because I was able to be myself. You know, being raised in a military family with two brothers, it wasn't a, you know, unusual for me to be around men. And so, and I feel like I have a good sense of humor and that was definitely part of my upbringing, you know, with my dad and my brothers and my mom. I think, you know, we all like to make jokes and and just have a a pretty good attitude on life. And so I I feel like Having a robust sense of humor really helped me in naval aviation for sure. And also having a thick skin and being able to not take things personally, I think that helped me as well. Was there ever a moment when you turned around and put somebody in their place? Oh, yeah. I, feel, I still feel kind of bad about it but, because it, it involved four letter words. And, um, and, you know, usually I, usually in the squadrons, like if, if you're having, a row, I guess, with somebody, you know, if, if you're having an argument with somebody about something or there's some conflict, you know, in general, we're taught, hey, go take care of that, like in private, don't do it in public. And in this, this one case, it was on my second deployment, and one of the junior officers in the squadron was just out of place or saying something that was really not cool. And I think I told him to F off, you know, in the squadron. And afterwards, he came up and apologized to me and he, and he was, he felt really bad about it. And I felt bad that, you know, I didn't handle it as well as I probably could have, but I mean, in general, you know, things don't come to a head like that. It is, it's not like Top Gun. <laughs> where We're like, always like, you know, like at each other and being really dramatic and angry. No, I mean, like we're a team. So I, I felt like for the most part, I was able to fit in really well. It was it was like having 30 brothers, you know, for better or worse. You know, they definitely look out for you, but they also pick on you a lot and um uh, you know, <laughs> take care of you. So And you talked about that the tail hook culture back in 91. Yeah. Was there still some of that going on when you were deployed and did you see that what really started to change that culture in that environment? Well, I personally don't feel like I saw that culture. I think that it was very, it it would be easy to just assume that that culture was still there. And I think some of the women on my deployment had some challenges because I think, you know, being in that, that new situation as a woman on an aircraft carrier, we were the first ones on the West coast to, to deploy. And so when you are, you know, being graded by the landing signal officers on your landing and they're telling you that, you know, you you did really badly. I think in that situation when you're the first group to go through something like that, it's understandable that you would question, especially given that there was still a lot of vocal opposition to having women on carriers. I think it's it's understandable that some women would wonder, okay, Am I getting this bad grade because I didn't have a good landing or is it worse because I'm a woman? Like, is there some influence on that because of my gender? I'm not saying that that was the case. I'm just saying that it's understandable that people would feel that way. Being open, I think, is what helped me. I certainly worried about that. There were articles in the newspaper in our hometown, you know, written by people saying that we shouldn't be there and that we weren't qualified to be there. And, you know, all of us women aviators are looking at each other like we just went through all the same training as the guys did. (laughs) Why? Like, we don't understand this. And so I think that being open to understanding that as a new pilot to the aircraft carrier, I've got a lot to learn and it's going to be challenging. And again, I, I had some some mentors in the squadron who who helped me realize that, hey, you know, you're new, you've got a lot to learn, you're going to get better, here's what you need to work on. And I worked my ass off. I mean, I worked really hard, (laughs) especially that first deployment to, to get better because I wasn't that great in the beginning. And many first tour pilots aren't. It's just, it's a really challenging environment to be in. But thankfully, I had some really good teachers out there. And you and the women around you blazed a trail for 
women aviators today. What does that look like today? If you look at how things are now, what does that look like for young women coming through and what are their opportunities compared with the ones you had? They have so many opportunities. It's it's such, you know, it makes it all worth it. <laughs> Absolutely. But, you know, that certainly contributed to the pressure that I think all of us felt, all of us women felt to realize that we were creating that path and that there was more pressure or we felt more pressure because we knew that because we were such a small group, if, if there's anything that we didn't do perfectly, that people could point to that and say, see, this is why you shouldn't let women do this job. And so that pressure was really intense. And I felt that because I wanted to make sure that any other qualified women who followed that path and became a naval aviator and wanted to fly jets on an aircraft carrier had the opportunity to do it and wasn't going to be judged because of her gender, um, because of anything that I did or the other women did. Like I wanted to make sure that we were demonstrating and proving that yes, women can do this job. So today it's fantastic. I mean, we have a woman who is on the Navy's Blue Angels F-18 demonstration flight team, which, you know, just a little side note there, (laughs) Uh, women have been qualified to do that, the F-18 demonstration pilot, for decades. And so while I'm really proud that there's a woman flying in the Blue Angels, I also feel like, why did it take so long? Like that took a crazy amount of time to finally have a, a woman accepted onto that team. But I'm thrilled that she's there because I think it's really important for young women and young men to see a woman on that team. And to know that women are serving and women are serving in all fighter squadrons in the Navy, in Marine Corps flight squadrons. That was not the case when I first got winged. Women were not allowed to fly at all in the Marine Corps because all of the jobs were directly related to combat. So women are flying in that as well. So aviation wise, women are doing everything. Now we have a woman CNO, so Chief of Naval Operations, and there's a female aviator who's a three-star admiral. So we're getting women into the senior ranks in the Navy. And that is because they finally have the experience that qualifies them to take on those larger responsibilities as a flag officer. And even roles that have traditionally been very physically demanding, such as the Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, reconnaissance jobs. The military is looking at those and they're really looking at how do we get the best qualified people into those roles? So there have been women Army Rangers. There's been a a woman captain who commanded a, a Ranger team. Women have qualified for Navy SEAL training, but I don't think any women have finished it. And That is, I mean, that is probably one of the last areas just because of the really rigorous physical demands, but it's also mentally super challenging, which women absolutely can do. But I think there will be a woman who finishes that course (laughs) and who becomes a Navy SEAL. Women have been supporting Navy SEALs in other capacities. So who knows? But I think really in any job in the military, You know, there's the basic physical fitness standard that you want for anyone who's in a military role, but then there's really, it should be job specific, not gender specific, ensuring that people are able to do the job that they need to do. And for naval aviation, it's, it's physically challenging, but it's not to the level of being a Navy SEAL. So there are other qualifications that matter that again, you know, aren't gender specific. There's something I really love about this narrative. And I often hear it when I'm talking to people who've been somewhat pioneering in what they've done is the absolute certainty that there will be more pioneers coming after them. Mm. So I love that. There will be a woman who becomes a fully fledged Navy SEAL. And you know that's true because you've been Mm. in that situation of being one of the first in your space, which is really impactful. I've had a couple of veterans on the podcast before US veterans who've talked about the transition from military to civilian. And that can be that can be a hard transition because the worlds are so different between those two environments. How was that for you, that transition into civilian life? What helped you from your military background? What did you find challenging? It was scary, (laughs) to be honest. I mean, having grown up in the military and then going right into Navy ROTC and then right into the Navy, I had never been what I would call a full civilian. (laughs) So, So I was really nervous about it. And there is a, you know, 
there is a protective quality, I think, about being in the military where you have this community that you're part of and you feel protected. You, you literally are protected when you're living on a military base. So there was that aspect of, oh my God, I, you know, I'm not going to have a steady paycheck coming from the government and I'm not going to have all these benefits that I had. And am I going to be successful in this new world? And so, you know, the way I thought of it was, it's like growing up, moving around when I was growing up, you know, when we moved to new area, you learn the language. If you're going to another country, you learn the culture, you learn how people relate to one another, you bring your own unique skills and strengths to that world. And so that's how I approached it. And I think my transition started with business school. So I did not go right from the military into a civilian job. I had a nice little buffer of two years where I felt like I could be in an environment with many civilians in school. And also, I was really lucky because my business school had, um, I think it was 40% of the students were international. So that was a huge change as well. You know, meeting people from all over the world where when I had been in the military, we'd pull into port into other countries, but I didn't really get to know people there locally. So, so I think falling back on my upbringing of being able to go into a new environment and become assimilated and make friends and you know just learn how to live in that world that really helped me as i transitioned to the civilian world and then i would also say just you know tapping into the veteran network in the civilian world and back then you know that was this is like 22 years ago it was hard to find other veterans there weren't online groups like there are now there there weren't communities and networks that were more formalized like there are now which is wonderful because I think it's a challenging transition. And the other big change for me was going from this environment where I very much felt like I was contributing to something bigger than myself and, you know, being part of a team that was doing something that felt impactful to a world where that wasn't always the case. Like that camaraderie wasn't always there. And I I felt like that's why I, I always really enjoyed working at startups because I felt like that was probably the closest. I felt to being in a squadron because it's a small unit, you're working really hard and it it just feels like the things you're doing are having more direct impact. So, so yeah, I would say it was a challenging transition, but I was lucky because I had done so much moving around growing up that I'd seen this movie before. (laughs) I kind of knew how, you know, how to approach it. And I think that's what helped. And I talked in the introduction about soaring highs and the crashing lows. I mean, the reality of your story is not all Tom Cruise, Top Gun and aircraft carriers and all that exciting stuff. It's also some really yeah. challenging times. What, what's a time yeah. that comes to mind in your civilian life where you were really challenged? What did that look like? Yeah, I, it's again, it's one of those, I guess I'd call it an unlock moment because it's very distinct. I remember exactly where I was. I was going through a divorce. The startup that I had co-founded was was struggling. And I I knew that we weren't going to be able to raise any more money. And so we were eventually going to have to shut it down. And, you know, typically when I'm feeling stuck, or if I'm not feeling great about something, I get outside and uh, I was living in Palo Alto at the time. And so there's a hike there on the Stanford campus called the dish, because there's this big satellite dish there. And so I was doing the dish, as we like to call it, and, you know, doing this I think it's a little over three mile hike around the dish. And I was up towards the top and I was looking out over Silicon Valley, essentially. And it hit me. I'm like, I don't have to keep doing this startup. Like I can do something else. Like I don't have to ride the sinking boat down to the depths of the ocean. And as part of the divorce, we sold our house in Palo Alto. So I had some cushion, you know, financially. And I realized, you know, I can actually do something I want to do. Not that I didn't want to do the startup. I, I definitely enjoyed the startup, but it was clear that it wasn't going to work. And I felt bad. I felt bad about that. You know, I, I definitely like to be successful. So I after that hike, I called the investor for the startup and I said, look, I, I don't think this startup is going to be successful. And, you know, we probably have, I don't know how much, you know, a few more months of runway, but 
I'm basically an overpaid office administrator at this point. I'm just, I feel like I'm wasting your money and I want to quit. <laughs> so, because I did, I felt bad about taking their money when I wasn't really doing a lot with it. And, and he was wonderful. He was so gracious. He said, look, we make a hundred investments every year. We expect two of them to be successful. So, you know, I, I actually really appreciate your honesty and your integrity and, you know, telling me this. So, so that was scary too, though, because then I didn't really know what was next. And it's tough, I think, to, it's much easier to come off of a, you know, a successful liquidation event for your startup versus shutting it down or quitting it, you know, and leaving it. But that was the moment where I realized I have more agency in my life than I think I realized. And I am capable of doing more than, I'm, than I probably realized. Your unlock moment there feels very much like mine when I left medicine. And I describe mm -hmm. it as this, this voice I still remember when I went, I don't have to do this career if I don't want to. But I didn't know whether I was going to leave or what I was going to do if I did leave. I just knew that I could. And that thing you just said, I knew I had agency. Yeah, That's really powerful. And I work often with people where when they've given themselves enough time to reflect, and I love that picture your painting of the three mile hike around the dish. And then you knew in that moment, you knew something you didn't know before. It didn't mean you knew what you were going to do with it, but you knew something. Talk to me about taking the time it takes. Yeah. I, at that point, I actually took almost a year and I worked with a coach, <laughs> a little plug there for coaching. And I, you know, took advantage of the time. I spent more time with my kids at their school, which was wonderful. And, you know, so grateful for that, that opportunity. But I think we all like to believe that we have more control over our lives than we actually do. And that's hard. I think that's hard for most of us that we want to feel like, okay, if we do this, then, you know, if we do X, then Y is going to happen. That's not always the case. Or why might happen, but it might not happen the way you want it to or when you want it to. And so, so that's why I think it's so important for us to be really clear about what matters most to us and to do everything we can to honor that in our lives and to make that happen in our lives. And sometimes it takes a while. And it's really funny because like this one woman show that I'm doing, you know, it's over 30 years since I... In college, you know, I really loved acting and loved theater. And I was trying to figure out how am I going to do that and be in the military. And so I did some community theater when I was in flight school. But once I joined the fleet and was flying on carriers, there, the schedules were not supportive of that. So I really put that on the back burner for a long, long time. And finally, just a couple of years ago, I wrote a one woman show about that first deployment on the USS Abraham Lincoln and the integration of women in combat squadrons. And I've been performing it. Actually, this Saturday will be my 30th performance of the show. And that would not have happened. I would not be doing the show had I not spent 10 years in the Navy flying, you know, had been one of the first women to do that role and had over time developed the confidence and the ability to tell a story and to share what that was like for an audience. So I, I just think it's kind of interesting to reflect on that, like being up on a stage here in New York, you know, off Broadway in college and high school, that was something I dreamed about. And it took me a long time, but it is something that's happening in my life finally. So, so I, you know, I would say it's, it's never too late. Sometimes things take a little longer than we'd like, <laughs> but, but then I, I think that there's a gift in that of being able to have faith that, you know, our lives are going to work out in a way that, that is good for us, even though we can't always see that. And I think people listening to this story are going to hear these threads that run through your life that sometimes are more forward and sometimes are a little bit less. But, you know, the artist, the performer that you were growing up, that's come through at the right time. But it, yeah. all, it all links together, it all ties together, which I think is really beautiful. And the way, the way you articulate is, is, is fantastic. So you've written this incredible best-selling book that's just come out called Soar Into Joy, A Combat Pilot's Wisdom or Falling in Love with Your Life. What was happening for you when you went, I've got to write a book? I feel really grateful that 
many things in my life have been, um, have been so good. I mean, I just, you know, yes, I have certainly had challenges. We've all had challenges and yet I feel really lucky. And I don't want to attribute all of the good things in my life towards, you know, this indiscriminate luck. I certainly have done things and set intentions and done the work, but I also feel like I've learned a lot of lessons, you know, from my time in the Navy, from my time working in tech and as a coach. And I've learned a lot from reading other people's stories and their experiences. And, you know, I've benefited from their wisdom. And I think that each of us has something of value to share with other people. My hope is that by my intention with writing the book was to share the things that have helped me and in hopes that it will help somebody else. Even if one person reading the book sees life a little bit more positively or, you know, becomes more open to possibility or has something in their life that benefits from reading the book, I will be thrilled. (laughs) So yeah, I I think I just, I've I've read so many, I guess, self-help books, leadership books, you know, just nonfiction. I'm a huge nonfiction reader. And I learned so much from each one of them that I wanted to be able to contribute to that knowledge pool and and that place of inspiration so that everyone can live a life that's fulfilling to them. And when you meet someone in your in your coaching or your leadership work that you do and you think they really need to read this book, my book, what's that <laughs> person where you go, please yeah. go and get a copy of my book? It's the person who um, has that unlock moment inside of them, (laughs) but it hasn't been unlocked yet. Mm -hmm. And they know that they want something different in their life, but they're afraid of doing it because change is challenging and change can be scary. But I absolutely believe that there are things that we want in our lives that we know we want, and we have to be fearless about going after them. And we have to recognize the fear, you know, and, and see it for what it, it is. It's a, a, a self-protection mechanism to keep us from hurting ourselves, you know, which is really helpful when you're doing something that might physically <laughs> harm you. But when you're looking at, at implementing a change that is more in line with who you are as a person and what, you, what matters to you, then that change is worth moving forward on. And it's okay to be scared and do it anyway. So I would say my book is for anybody who is feeling stuck, who knows that they want something different in their lives, or maybe they're just really not sure what's next. And they're trying to figure out, you know, what they want to do with our one precious life. As Mary Oliver says, it's just, you know, we get one, one go around on this planet. Well, some people think we get reincarnated, who knows, but (laughs) at least with this life, I think we should believe that, that, that fulfilled life is possible for us and take the steps we need to, to make it happen. And that, teenage Laurie, the older sister, moving around and feeling a bit nervous about going to the new school. If you could go back in time and put your arm around her shoulder and say something in her ear, knowing what you know now about the path you've taken, what would you say? Oh, I would say don't care about what other people think. Be true to what you really love in life and have faith that it's going to work out because it will. I love that. Thanks. How can people find out more about you and the work that you do? My website is lauriedrowdy.com, L-O-R-E-E-D-R-A-U-D-E.com. I'm also on Instagram, uh, Lori Drowdy, my first and last name together. And yeah, I'd love to hear from you. And my book is available on Amazon. So if you, if you search on Amazon for my name, I actually have two books. I wrote a book about that first deployment on the Abraham Lincoln And that was published 23 years ago, but that's also available on Amazon as well. Fantastic. The Unlock Moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead for pioneering female combat pilot, Laurie Drowdy. It was the opportunity to be a pilot that opened up new horizons of unique challenge and achievement and helped her to shape a path through life where she found her flow and brought her authenticity. Do check out Laurie's book, Soar Into Joy, A Combat Pilot's Wisdom, on falling in love with your life on Amazon and at all good bookstores. 
I don't often share reviews, but I did love this one. The book explores both her outstanding accomplishments and her personal challenges, telling a tale of resiliency and development. It's hard to believe the things that the author faces. This makes me feel that nothing is impossible. And I hope that today you, my listeners, have felt the same. Laurie, it's been a truly inspiring conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Unlock Moment. Thank you, Gary. If you've enjoyed this conversation with a true female trailblazer, then check out episode 115 with biotech pioneer Vicky Sato. And if you resonated with how Laurie showed courage to forge a path that others could follow, check out episode 96 with the inspirational Parry Radia and episode 81 for my memorable conversation with Megan Onan. Bookmark these episodes for later. This has been The Unlock Moment, a podcast with me, Dr. Gary Crotez. Thank you for listening in. You can find out more about how to figure out what you want and how to get it in my book, The Idea Mindset. Find me on Instagram at Dr. Gary Crotez and subscribe to this podcast to get notified about future episodes. Most listeners to this podcast on Apple and Spotify haven't yet hit the follow button. If there's one thing you can do right now to help me out, then please click the follow button. The more followers I have, the better guests I can attract for you to learn from. Thanks again for listening and join me again soon here on The Unlock Moment.